Okay, so today I'd like to talk to you about resilient user experiences. And what I mean by this is we want to be thinking about taking, uh, applying the same sort of thinking we've been doing about fault tolerance at the sort of lower level and pushing that out to the product design level. We want to be building user experiences that are adaptive to failure so that you're thinking about when, the next time you have a single database or a single data, data store failure, that it doesn't interrupt the rest of your customer experience. And so to illustrate this, I want to compare two different scenarios, one offline and one online. So follow me along on these. The first is, let's imagine that you're walking through a grocery store. You're going up, the, up and down the aisles, and you're picking up a couple of basics. And back in the corner of the store, there's this public restroom. And it's got a little bit of a problem. The faucet's a little bit clogged up, and it's just you know, sort of spewing water all over the floor. And now imagine if the response to this is that the store sends out a security guard to start clearing out the store. This guy comes through and he says to everybody in the aisles, drop your shopping carts and please leave the store immediately. Now, yeah, you're laughing. And, and yes, this is an incredibly frustrating experience. It makes no sense. There's no reason that, it, that it, what seems like a minor issue with a sink should close the entire store down. And while this seems somewhat contrived, let's compare what we might be doing online with our own websites. So suppose that you're shopping online and you're looking through a product page similar to this one, and we have a little widget further down on the page with, with a view counter. Now we've isolated these view counts into, a, into an isolated store, but what happens if the database that stores these falls over? So we'll sort of look under the covers a little bit. We probably have a database class that, that makes connections and handles the queries, and it's gonna throw a connection uh, exception if it fails to make a connection to the database. And so the engineer who's building this page sees that exception and he thinks, hey, well, so I don't really know what to do about that. I haven't really thought about that. Nobody's told me. I can't anticipate what to do around a failure scenario. So they ignore it and uh, throw it further up the stack and nobody catches it. So we see something like this. We see a stack trace for the user, which is uh, hopefully you'll agree this is a somewhat suboptimal uh, scenario. So what do we do? We fix that. We, we make a, a customized error template, and we, and we catch it there. But this is also uh, a pretty crappy si situation to have. So in fact, you know, wrapping a stack trace with a, uh, a logo and your site chrome and some really useful error messaging is, is really no better than, than showing the stack trace itself. It's just barely. But what we're really telling the visitor in this scenario is, please drop your shopping carts and leave the store immediately. In both cases, the critical path to completing a purchase has been interrupted by some kind of ancillary back-end service that's failed on us. In the first case, it was a clogged sink. In the second case, it was a view counter. Neither of these should have been important to the shopper. And so we're all here at Velocity because we're involved in building large-scale websites and applications. And presumably, you've got a number of different services and data stores backing your, backing your applications. Each of those is an opportunity for your site to fail. So we need to distinguish the services that make up the critical path from those that are only providing some sort of ancillary value. So let's take another look at an example from Etsy. <clears throat> now you might look at this and you, and you think this page looks pretty okay. But if you happen to be an avid user of Etsy, you might be looking at this and saying, something's horribly, horribly broken here. There's something missing. And what's missing would, would appear in these spots. There should be, up in, the, up in the top of the page, there should be an underhand message count, and further on the, on the right-hand side of the page, there should be a favorites tool, which allows us to bookmark things to come back to later. And what they usually look like is this. So we've just filled them in the same place. Now, people who use the site regularly are using these, these types of tools on a daily basis, and they would recognize that they're missing. Yet casual users who, are, who make up most of our shoppers would actually have no idea that anything was wrong here, and they can just continue on their shopping experience unimpeded. In fact, there are a number of back-end services that make up this page. This kind of illustrates all the different things and all the different pieces of content that, that lie on this page and, and, different and that they come from different places. But the critical thing for this page is that you can come and you can see a product, you can look at the photos. Further down the page below, below the screen here is a, a description you want to be able to read, and you need to be able to add to the cart. And those are really the only things you need to be able to do on this page. But when those features have failed, the page hasn't fallen apart. We haven't shown a stack trace. 
our app code has detected the problem and rendered the rest of the pages, uh, the rest of the page without these features. So our site is up, our ops team is probably responding, but they're not totally insane, and our visitors are continuing to shop. So we're making some money here. So this is a graceful degradation. What we've done is we've just simply hidden the features from the users. This is the most straightforward pattern for resilience in your UI. So in fact, these black boxes cover up all sorts of different pieces of information that, that make up our page that are mostly ancillary to the, the, the critical path, and they can fail independently. Each could be dropped without really impacting the user experience. And we can do this for other sites as well. It's not just, not just for Etsy. We could look at other pages uh, across like Amazon, who's known for making up, um, for building their pages from hundreds of services. So you can see there's, there's a number of pieces of content and different services that make up this page. And this isn't just for e-commerce either. You could look at a, a, tra or a uh, content-heavy site like the New York Times. And while the New York Times, their business model may be built around subscriptions and ads, the most important thing here is for people to be able to come and read the news. And if they can't serve the news, irrespective of all the other things on this page, then visitors are going to abandon the site. So think about the content and services on your own sites. And if one piece fails, are you able to respond to that, or are you throwing people out the door? So failure doesn't just happen in a completely up or down state. We can degrade. We can have slowdowns in different back-end services. And so on our search results pages at Etsy, we serve some sponsored ads at the top of the results. Now, the page gives the ad service 400 milliseconds before it times out and just continues to render the rest of the page without the ads, which means that we're favoring fast page responses over complete page responses. It's OK not to have ads on this site. And we can also improve resilience by moving non-critical data into non-blocking AJAX requests. So by doing this, we reduce the potential failure modes in the base HTML. We actually lighten the base HTML so we can get it to the browser more quickly because we're putting less content into it. And in the meantime, the non-critical elements that are pointed out here can load, a, load synchronously with the rest of the visual assets that are gonna appear on the page. So we use Google Apps a lot at work. And I see resilient uh, interfaces here all the time in Google Apps. They're really good with this. Google Apps makes a lot of client-server communications, and when they detect that something's wrong with the back-end service or the network connection, they provide feedback to the user. And one of my favorite examples is, has this in the message. It's got a little timer that counts down. So the app, rather than failing entirely, when it sees a network degradation or a service degradation, it doesn't keep hammering on the back-end service over and over again. It actually backs off. It gives an interval until it retries a little bit later, and it lets the user know that. So exponential back off is something that we think about and, and we've seen in lower level services and protocols, but we rarely see it at the level of UI. So this is a really, really cool example. Another case of messaging I saw recently was from Bitly. This is actually, this message came from their older interface. But the right messaging for your visitors in, in a time of failure is really an art form, and it's part of resilience. So in this case, I tried to get to some click data. I tried to see some things that were going on with, with, with URLs that I stored on Bitly. And when I got there, uh, it was clear that something was going wrong. But the really wonderful part about this message is not only did they convey that something was wrong with the backend service, but they are reassuring me that the data that I have stored in their service is still there, and that it's gonna be there when the service recovers. So how do you do this? This isn't really an easy answer because it requires cross-functional involvement from a variety of different teams. And it requires planning for failure scenarios as opposed to just planning for 100% availability in your services, which is what we're really, really good at. And at Velocity, you'll hear people talking about DevOps coordination. For me, this is about taking operational experience and wisdom and pushing it out to the engineering team because our engineering team actually helps run the site. We don't just build the software, but we help operate it. And so I say that we also need to include our product teams in these types of discussions. We need to be educating our product teams on how our sites are built and the technical underpinnings behind each and every part of the interface. We need to address how each of these could be failing independently so that we don't, we don't suffer an entire site outage when one goes down. 
We circle up from time to time to talk about the new features that we're going to launch on the site and how we respond to the last outage or site, site degradation. So operability reviews and postmortems are an excellent opportunity to include your product teams and help instruct them on how, and how we run our sites. Your engineering and ops teams should be teaching your product team how to think with an operational mindset. And your product team is going to be informing your engineering and ops teams of the business priorities of the site. What features make up your critical path? What features can fail independently? And in the course of failure, how do we communicate that? Do we just hide the features? Do we provide messaging to the users? And if we provide messaging, what's the sort of tone that we use? Is it funny? Is it serious? Or maybe sympathetic? It's your product team's responsibility to help engineers understand these priorities and to be able to make decisions on the fly as they're building software. So here's a really simple hack that you can take home and try yourself. Put a beacon onto your error template, like the template we saw earlier. Report those on a graph and show that in real time to your entire team, to your entire business. These page views are people who've gotten off track. They're out of your critical path, and you've essentially shown them the door. They're going to leave the site. What failed so that you're showing them an error page, and what can you be doing to prevent these views in the future? Resilient user experience is hard. Designing for failures is difficult. It's not what we like to see. We like to think about 100% availability. But solid understanding of how your site is built and which pieces are going to fail is important. It requires knowledge sharing across engineering, ops, and product to do these things well. And when you do, when you can withstand a service outage or a database failure without your site going down, without your business metrics having a serious problem, then you realize that this effort really, really pays off. And it turns out that your ops team is going to give you a great big hug for this because it's going to make their job a lot easier. I want to thank you for your time this morning. Enjoy the rest of the conference.